I'm Jim Barth, the professor of economics here at George Washington University and the moderator of today's program on the federal budget and economic growth. This program is sponsored by the National Economist Club's Educational Foundation in George Washington University. We're especially fortunate today to have two distinguished economists here to discuss this important subject. We have Dr. Edward Gramlich and Dr. William Niskanen. Dr. Gramlich is currently the Deputy Director of the U.S. Congressional Budget Office, as well as on leave from the University of Michigan, where he's a Professor of Economics and Public Policy. Dr. Niskanen is currently the Chairman of the Cato Institute here in Washington, D.C., and formerly a member of President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors from 1981 to 1985. Before turning to our panel members, I'd like to briefly summarize what has happened to the federal budget during the post-World War II period. For this purpose, we have distributed two figures which summarize what has happened to federal spending, federal revenues, and the federal deficit. These figures were prepared by Frank Russ at the U.S. Congressional Budget Office. What they show is that federal spending as a share of output has tended to trend upwards over the entire period. For fiscal year 1986, which ended in September, federal spending was approximately $1 trillion, or about 24% of gross national product. In contrast, federal revenues as a share of output have remained relatively flat during the post-World War II period. For fiscal year 1986, revenues were approximately $770 billion, or about 19% of GMP. The difference between federal spending and federal revenues is a measure of the budget surplus or deficit. Every year since 1969, the federal budget has been in deficit and reached a record $221 billion in fiscal year 1986, which was slightly more than 5% of gross national product. With this background, I'd now like to ask each of our panel members to tell us what the effects of these federal deficits are on economic growth and our trade balance with other nations. I'll begin by asking Ned Gramlich. Thank you. Well, I think the deficit problem is a very serious national problem. And it's made worse by the fact that the normal kinds of economic variables that we tend to look at don't immediately register any problem. By that, I mean to say that in, in the uh, period when deficits have been very high in the past uh, five to seven years, depending on how one counts, o over much of this period, interest rates have fallen, inflation has fallen, unemployment has fallen, and real GNP, at least since 1982, has risen at at least a standard rate, if not an outstanding rate. And so it is very natural to ask, well, if such is the case, when we've had large deficits, what is the problem? Well, the problem, very simply, is that of a share of our total production that we are devoting far less to building up our national wealth than we were in, in prior years. The, as a result of the high deficits, we are, as often one sees in the paper, we are draining off domestic saving, and this can hurt in either one of two ways. It, it can either directly reduce the amount of capital that we're putting in place to provide for future living standards, or it can generate foreign borrowing, which has been very high, and which in effect means that, that even if our domestic capital is being put in place, that we don't own it. Now, as a result of the latter, the foreign borrowing, the necessary implication of that is that we have a very high trade deficit, that our, our imports greatly exceed our exports, and so we begin to lose jobs to, to uh, foreign trade and so forth. But th this is really the problem. This, this is what, this, this means that in the future we are in effect, or right now we are in effect running a consumption binge, we are living beyond our means, and this means that in the future, the rate of growth of living standards in America will be significantly less because of the large deficits. Bill, perhaps we can ask you to. Yes. Federal borrowing reduces future economic growth by shifting resources from uh, investment into either government or private consumption. 
Now, the composition of the crowding out effects of federal deficits, I think, has not been stable over the years. But on the average, it looks as if about half of federal deficits are, are matched by a crowding out or reduction of domestic private investment. And the rest is spread by a reduction of state and local spending, uh, private consumption, foreign uh, investment, foreign consumption. But if, for example, in the last few years we've been running deficits of about $200 billion, if that means that private investment is lower by uh, $100 billion, net private investment is lower by $100 billion then than it would otherwise be, we might be losing future economic growth at the rate of, uh, uh, of 10 to $15 billion a year for each year that we run these current deficits. So we are, in effect, borrowing from our children and our grandchildren to pay for government and private consumption uh, at the present time. Now, one of the sources from which we're, one of the means by which we're borrowing is that we're borrowing abroad. Right now, we are using about 3% more resources in this country than we're producing, and that uh, is money that is loaned to us. Uh, those are resources that are loaned to us in which we will have to pay interest and dividends uh, to foreigners over the years and that will reduce our future uh, uh, available consumption by that amount. Is it, uh, I, I, from listening to the two of you, I, I hear you saying that basically perhaps we're, we've not had as much crowding out to, with respect to domestic investment because of the uh, foreign capital inflows. Is, could you elaborate a bit more on that point, Nick? Well, I've, the, uh, there, there is some mystery about exactly how this works, but a plausible way in which it works is that the deficits in the short run raise domestic interest rates in the United States, and this sets up an incentive for foreigners to invest in this country, which sounds like a good thing, and indeed, given the deficits, probably is a good thing in the sense that the, the investment is taking place here and there is some job creation here. But there, there is a, uh, some bad news to go with this good news, and the bad news is that as the foreign capital flows in, that that pushes up the dollar. The, the dollar is uh, still high now relative to what it was five or eight years ago, and that makes it very difficult for U.S. traders, both exporters and those who compete with imports, to compete in foreign trade. They're competing at a price disadvantage. And the main reason for that price disadvantage is the high deficits, which is stimulating this borrowing from abroad. Bill, would you like to comment also? Uh, in 1981, the Reagan administration had a clear objective to increase the amount of spending uh, in our country for domestic private investment uh, and for defense. They did not have a clear idea of where these resources were going to come from. Now, it turns out over the years that these resources have come primarily from abroad and, and are diverted from our trade-affected sectors, our import competing uh, and our export sectors, into the defense and the capital goods sectors. Now, that, I, that, is, the, that is the process by which this uh, diversion has taken place, is that the increase of interest rates has induced the increase in the exchange rate and the change in the trade balance then that has pulled resources both from abroad and away from the trade dependent sectors into the sectors in which uh, had been stimulated by the Reagan fiscal policy of 1981. Now starting in 1985, that fiscal policy was reversed. Congress for the first time in many years reduced the total budget authority for defense and uh, in this year, 1986, approved a tax measure, the Tax Reform Act of 1986, that will, I believe, significantly reduce the level of domestic business investment. That is the, the reverse of the process that started in 1981, and I think is the primary reason why we've had some decline in the dollar since February of 1985, and just recently, uh, the beginning of a decline in the trade deficit. Some economists have argued uh, that, that deficits really don't affect interest rates and thereby adversely affect perhaps domestic investment or uh, raise the value of the dollar. I, 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 I'd like uh, Ned perhaps to, to comment on, on that view and as to whether or not he thinks it's a, a correct view or not. Well, the, the, uh, the, the claim sounded a little 
contradictory, if I may say. I, the, uh, in, let me develop this the way it has developed in the profession. In the old days, people would believe in what is known in the jargon of economics as a closed economy. That is, in, in effect, the whole world is the United States. And in that kind of view, if you have deficits that you, you would have to draw the funds in to finance the deficit, so you pretty much have to drive up interest rates and you would have to crowd out domestic investment. Nowadays, the, it is becoming increasingly apparent that we can perhaps better think of the United States economy as an open economy where it is uh, drawing on world capital markets. And what happens in, in this kind of uh, a system is that it, it can take a fairly slight rise in interest rates, maybe so slight as to be barely perceptible to draw in the capital, take advantage of the high rates of return in America, drive up the dollar, and, and cause the, the trade balance to suffer. So that the, the kind of situation you get is that if interest rates move a lot, it is likely that the trade balance will move very little. On the other hand, if interest rates move very little, it is likely that the trade balance will move quite a lot. So that uh, people will, will uh, claim various things. Sometimes they claim that interest rates don't go up much and that means it's no problem. But as, as I laid out the argument a second ago, that, uh, that is not the implication. If interest rates don't go up very much, it, it may simply mean that we're borrowing a lot from abroad and conversely. So the, the, uh, the argument spins around. But I, I do, between these two views, I, I am more uh, an open economy person myself. I tend to think that the international linkages are getting quite important and therefore that the fact that interest rates may not go up much is not necessarily meaningful. That, that what we ought to keep our eyes on is the amount of our resources that we're devoting to capital formation. Bill, Ms. Kenner, would you like to... Uh, most economists uh, believe that deficits must have some effect on interest rates, but it has been uh, very difficult with the most sophisticated econometric techniques to identify the effect. And I think the reason for that, as Ned suggests, is that the supply of capital to the United States is much more responsive to interest rates than the supply of saving within the United States. And that means that the interest rate effect of deficits may very well be swamped by a variety of other conditions that also affect interest rates. And for that reason, it has proven very difficult to get a, uh, a very good estimate of the consequences of, of deficits on interest rates, although I think there is not much dispute in, in theory about the issue. Perhaps we could uh, ask each of you to say something about what should be done about these, these deficits. In particular, is the Graham-Rudman-Howlings legislation requiring or mandating a balanced budget by 1991 sufficient to deal with this deficit problem? Or do we need supplementary policies? For example, should uh, monetary policy be more expansive and thereby provide for a greater growth in the economy and thereby help reduce the, the federal deficits? Ned? Well, let me, uh, I'm, I'm going to put monetary policy aside for, for now. Let me, let me focus on the first part of the question on Graham Redmond Hollings. We can come back to monetary policy. The, when we're, Setting about to cut our deficits, there is no substitute for plain old cuts and deficits. That is, somehow or other, we have to either lower spending or raise taxes to get rid of the deficit problem. There is an aspect of Graham Redmond Hollings that was black magic, that we would simply legislate a declining path for deficits over a five year period, and having done that, we could all go home and uh, that, that the deficit problem is now legislated to go away, and it will go away, and we don't have to attend to the problem. If this kind of thinking uh, goes out with Graham Redman, which I probably, uh, it's probably no surprise to say is, uh, it, its life is uh, in, in some doubt right now, then that won't be, that, that kind of thinking won't be missed. But I think there is another aspect of Graham-Rudman that 
that was actually a bit helpful in, in this first year, the 1986, where, which was really the first budget negotiation that took place with the law in effect. And that is that, that the graham Redman cuts were, were so painful on such a limited section of the budget that really everybody realized that these could not be allowed to happen. They would just got certain aspects of the budget. They would leave totally protected other aspects of the budget. It, this would be both uh, inequitable across budget categories and, uh, and quite unwise, inefficient even in the economics <coughs> jargon again. And that uh, the the uh, the whole pattern of cuts was was so undesirable that we couldn't let it happen, and we had to sit down and negotiate a budget compromise. Now that was actually done in in the budget for fiscal eighty seven. There was a lot of newspaper reporting at the time that that the Graham Redmond targets were met by smoke and mirrors and asset sales and and so forth. And to be sure, there was a lot of that, too much of that for. Uh, a lot of us at CBO, but the uh, the smoke and mirrors should not obscure the point that there were some real cutbacks as well. There, the uh, defense spending was put on a on a lower growth trend in in the uh, over the past two years is actually a declining real path, as as Bill has mentioned earlier. And there were there were some cuts in domestic spending as well, not not as large as in defense, but there were they were there nevertheless. Gre general revenue sharing is one program that was actually killed in this period. So I think the uh, the the first year with Graham Rudman has shown some success in in cutting the deficit. Both the short and the long run deficit forecast look a lot better now than they did a short time ago, maybe perhaps a year and a half ago. I think this year, however, that uh, th there are some real questions because we have gotten ourselves, even with the cuts, we have gotten ourselves pretty far from the Graham Redmond targets. And, and the question is whether they will be credible this year and whether they will stimulate the uh, productive behavior that they have appeared to stimulate in the past year. Uh, Bill, perhaps you could say something about Graham Redmond first. Yes. Um, Grand Redmond, I think, has made a useful contribution to reducing the deficit for the first year or so. But I predict that uh, by next September, the Grand Redmond deficit targets will be evaded, uh, changed, or repealed. So I th uh, some of the Grand Redmond pr procedures may very well last, and I think they can continue to make a, a useful contribution. There are two levels of, of issues here. One is uh, what types of spending should be reduced and what types of taxes, if any, sh should be increased to reduce the deficit? And second is, is there some process, is there some rule by which we might bind ourselves that would contribute to forcing the issue of either reduced spending or higher taxes? Graham Redman uh, was described by one of its sponsors, Senator Redman, as a bad idea whose time has come. And I think that reflects my own views. It, it, it is a crude uh, instrument. But a close examination of the congressional budget process suggests that it's a rather crude instrument as well. So I don't, uh, I don't regret going down the road of Graham Rudman, even if we take a major detour, uh, I think, fairly soon this summer. On monetary policy, I think we should recognize that the direct effect of monetary policy, as well as on fiscal policy, is, is on total demand, not total output. Now, if you increase economic money growth, in response to a reduction of the deficit, you might, be, you might be able to maintain the total demand path, but uh, that uh, doesn't by itself then get at the whole question of the relationship between demand and output. A lot of the slippage between changes in demand and changes in output in the short run have been in our foreign account balances, and sooner or later we have to bring that trade deficit down. Ned, I know you're at the Congressional Budget Office and not the Federal Reserve Board, but could we still get you to say something perhaps about monetary policy and its role in this deficit problem? Well, I, I basically agree with, with what Bill has just said. I, I don't think it can help much. I, it perhaps can't help at all. The uh, a simple way to look at it and, and the way the Fed uh, began looking at these problems 
six or seven years ago is to focus on the simple, plain old rate of growth of money. If, if you focus on that, the Fed has already followed a fairly expansionary policy. The, the rate of growth of money has been uh, 10, 15 percent, depending on the time period, and it's, it's hard to imagine a much more expansionary policy if, if the Fed were significantly more expansionary and, and tried to bring down the unemployment rate more, more rapidly, there is a significant possibility that we would uh, just get a renewed burst of inflation. And one thing that, that has been fortunate in the 80s is that the rate of inflation has gone down, and I think nobody would want to go back to the, the earlier period when we had high inflation. So I would be worried about uh, renewed expansion, uh, a, ter a, a much more expansionary monetary policy. It, it's, it's, of course, true within uh, a narrow range that uh, if the Fed is more expansionary, uh, gro economic growth will be perhaps slightly greater for, for some period and, and we'll get more tax revenues. But, but that is really not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is in fiscal policy and, and in particular in either cutting spending or raising taxes. Uh, let me follow up, Ned. You, you mentioned asset sales and, and seem to give the impression that you're opposed to the sale of assets, uh, perhaps to deal with the deficit problem. That is nonetheless a, a way to, to deal with a, a deficit problem. What is your opposition to, to asset sales, or was it uh, as strongly expressed as well, I indicated? Well, I, I don't actually have anything against asset sales. We, some of these asset sales are, for example, things like Conrail. We are now going to uh, sell you Conrail. And we're also going to sell you a bunch of student loans and farmers' loans and, and some other things. And to the extent you want to, you, the private sector, wants to buy these assets and, and manage them and uh, privatize some functions of the federal government, that, uh, that it is very questionable that the, the federal government uh, should be should be involved in, then there is nothing wrong with that. I, I, I would hope we'd, we'd look at these matters one by one and uh, sell assets when the, the, the relevant uh, loan collecting function or whatever can be more efficiently done in the private sector. But th that, that's one question. But the second question is, uh, suppose we sell <coughs> assets, is that a reduction in the federal deficit? And in some underlying sense, it is not, because the only thing that is happening is that there is a trade of assets, that, that uh, the federal government is, is selling something to the private sector and the private sector is paying for it. There has been no change in the income anybody's receiving. There's been no change in anybody's tax liabilities. We have an anomalous way of counting the federal budget, which gives us credit for deficit reduction in the year that we sell the asset. But that is really more a reflection of the fact that, that our uh, counting conventions are quite right than the fact that we have real deficit reduction. Be the, the main problem with asset sales is that, that it can uh, give us the illusion that we're doing something about the deficit when we're really not. Uh, Bill, do you share Ned's? Uh, yes, views? entirely. The case for asset sales is that these assets uh, or these uh, governmental institutions are better managed uh, in the private sector, uh, and if they're not, they shouldn't be sold. Uh, the the reported reduction of the deficit in the year of sale is an illusion. Uh, it does not reduce deficits in the out years, and it does not increase net national saving even in the year of sales because, of course, it has to absorb, uh, you have to absorb the amount of, uh, of resources that, uh, the, that the private parties buy or pay for uh, for these assets. So I have strongly supported the administration's asset sales program, but I think that the whole issue should be divorced from the, from the question of reducing the deficit. We've focused a lot on, on deficits. What I'd like to do is uh, get you to focus a bit more on the components uh, of, of the federal budget, that is government spending and government revenues. And let me ask uh, Ned first if, if he could say something about the role of spending in, in taxes, whether or not perhaps spending and, and taxes are more important uh, than deficits in, in trying to deal with current economic problems pertaining to, to economic growth. Well, there are several ways that this question can be answered. 
first off, on a, at a political level, we have a very serious stalemate right now in Washington that there are basically three ways to cut the deficit. We can cut defense spending, we can cut non-defense spending, or we can raise taxes. And the, the president does not want to cut defense spending, is, does not want to raise taxes, and most people in Congress do not want to cut non-defense spending. So we're just sitting here. Uh, every now and then we have a law like Graham Redman that, that will get some uh, productive negotiation going on, but it, it seems to be rather fleeting. And so, so here we sit. And the, the, that's, that's a statement of, of what is in Washington. Now the next question is what should be? Should we be cutting defense and non-defense or raising taxes or whatever? And one can argue that from a standpoint of the impartial economist or from the standpoint of the citizen on, on what uh, you as a, was a per, as a person would actually like to do. And I'm not going to get into the latter. I'll just talk about this from the standpoint of the impartial economist. The, um, there are arguments for not cutting defense spending. One can, if, if, you, if you look at the uh, record, one can clearly develop a case that we were in, in a risky national security position around about the late 70s or the early 80s, and we had to build up the defense budget. The, we have built it up a lot. Defense spending has risen at, uh, I, I can't quote a number, but perhaps uh, between 81 and 85, maybe 8, 10 percent real terms. It's now significantly higher than it was. It's been cut in the last two years. The, there, we have, uh, we're preparing options all the time on, on, on ways to cut the defense budget. And I can tell you that uh, even looking as hard for, for potential cuts as I, as I do, when you start with, with a flat pattern of defense spending that is now programmed and look for, for cuts, it, it looks to me like we're, we're making real trade-offs. That's not to say we shouldn't make them, but it, it is to say that there does not seem to be extraordinary amounts of uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, to, to use three words I heard somewhere, in, in the defense budget. Now, on the domestic side, the uh, things get more controversial. I mean, there, there are a number of programs like uh, programs for low-income people, welfare, and things like that. And these have, have already suffered very sharp cutbacks in, in real terms. Most grants to state and local governments have, have already shuff, suffered very sharp cutbacks in, in real terms. The, uh, there, there are a couple of rapidly growing items in the budget. One is the farm program that is, that is really uh, almost gone out of control. And I think most economists would love to cut that back, but, but most politicians will immediately give you the reason why we can't. And then we have the entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, and things like that, where there, there is growth. But on the other hand, there is a trust fund to, to pay for the benefits. So, so this long uh, journey through the federal budget indicates that it's long but quick, but in any case, the, the indication is that there, there is not a lot of stuff in there that is easy to cut. That's not to say we shouldn't try, we shouldn't do some, but, but there, are, there are certainly uh, sensible reasons for keeping the spending, and there are certainly strong clientels in, in favor of keeping it. And I, I guess my position on this is then that uh, we, we go through and try to cut what we can cut. But once we're done with that, and we, we've been at it for five or six years, then I think we have to tax ourselves to, to pay for these, these spending. I'm all for trying to cut spending, but we have, we have tried hard and we're just not getting very far with it. And, and at some point, we rather than uh, trying harder, we, we may want to, in effect, just uh, give up and, and tax ourselves for the spending that we seem to want to do. Bill, can we get you to respond? Yes. The uh, central insight of supply-side economics is that the economic effects of fiscal policy depend importantly on the details of the budget and the tax code. Now, the implications of that are that you can have a wide range of economic effects for the same budget totals. Uh, depending upon how the money is spent 
and how the money is raised. Now, an economist can describe more or less the, uh, the consequences of changes in components of the budget and changes in, in uh, the structure of the tax code on the economy. But to go beyond that then reflects the person's own political judgments about what it is that the federal government ought to be doing or should not be doing. Uh, I think we can, Ned and I are very likely to agree, at least in the general direction of the economic consequences of these different types of changes, but uh, the, the hard questions are, uh, is it more important to spend money for some specific government program with its economic effects than, uh, than to reduce the deficit. And that is something in which uh, we have no, I think, no special expertise. Now, I've got a long list of things that I would like to see cut. And if we have to raise taxes, uh, a preferred list of taxes uh, to consider. But uh, that uh, would reflect, in that case, my personal uh, political values. Can I ask you, I mentioned at the outset that uh, federal spending was about 24% uh, percent of gross national product, and it, had been, it has been trending upwards uh, throughout the post-World War II period. Whether uh, an economist can say anything about the optimal share of output that ought to go to the, the federal government, is that uh, a question you'd like to try and handle, Ned? I, I don't think an economist can say much about that question. I think that... Um, going back to the supply side factors that Bill mentioned, that most economists, even liberal economists, would say that, that when tax rates got very high, such as they are in many European countries now, that when you have a deficit, that is your, your spending line is above your tax line, that in some sense you have no option. That is, you can't raise tax rates any higher and you have to bring spending down. I, I was uh, uh, visiting Sweden last summer, and I would put the Swedish economy in that category. There is simply nothing left that moves over there that they haven't taxed to the maximum rate. And there I think their options are closed, and I think an economist can go in, as, as I was one who uh, one of a team who did, and say, look, you've, you've got to cut your spending. There's just no, no option here. But I think that I would put the United States in a different category. Our tax rates are not high by international standards. They may be higher than they should be, but uh, th that is not a judgment that one would get to on economic grounds. So I would say that we're right in a range when it becomes a more political decision, a less an economic decision. It's really a decision about how much we value these extra spending programs that, that, are, uh, that, that take spending up to 24 percent over the 19 percent that we're prepared to tax ourselves. Uh, Bill, perhaps I could ask you to uh, perhaps deal with the issue of should we perhaps raise taxes now to, to finance this spending at about a 20 percent, uh, 24 percent share of output? Well, I, I think that we should try to reduce spending as much as possible and then after a while, though, we have to recognize that Congress may be resistant to further cuts, and we may have reached that stage already. That may not satisfy me or others, but I think that's, uh, that may be a political fact of life, at which time I think then we have to consider uh, raising taxes. Now, an economist can bring some, uh, some advice to that process, however. Uh, prior to the Tax Reform Act of 1986, it looks as if the cost to the economy of an additional dollar of taxes is about a dollar fifty, given the misallocative effects of the tax structure itself and to some extent of what the government spends the money on. And that means that we should apply an increasingly stringent test to government spending as a function of how high taxes are and in, in part a function of the structure of the tax code. In, country, in, in, in Canada, that estimate is like $2 uh, of cost to the economy for every dollar of additional revenue. In countries like Sweden, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, and so forth, that number is probably a lot higher than that. That means that we should be placing a very, very stringent test on the case for additional federal spending because the costs of that spending are a good bit more than the, than the direct budget outlays for that, uh, that activity. Right now, we're in a political impasse because our political system is reflecting 
uh, almost a schizophrenic preference for 24% of our GNP spent through the federal budget and, and taxes of only 19% of GNP. And it, it impresses me, however, that if there is an optimum for the U.S. population, it is very likely within that range, uh, within the 19 to 24% range, we would need a 40% increase in revenues from the personal and corporate income tax to balance the budget. And I cannot believe the American public would support 24% uh, of GNP through the budget if they faced that much higher taxes. Conversely, we would need something like an eight-year period of, of zero real growth of the federal budget to balance the budget without an increase in taxes. And I don't believe our political system is going to be willing to do that. That means two full presidential terms of no growth in the federal budget would be necessary to balance it without a tax increase. So for the American population, given the kinds of preferences that are reflected uh, one way or the other through our political process, I think that that number uh, is somewhere between 19 and 24 uh, percent. That is just a, an empirical observation given the way that this process has worked. Uh, perhaps I could ask each of you, since this is the, 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 the budget cycle, or the budget cycle has just about begun, people are talking about deficits in, in coming years, and perhaps they'll be trending downwards according to some forecasts. Uh, could you, each of you perhaps say something about your view of what's going to happen to the federal budget uh, in, in the coming years? Are you optimistic or somewhat pessimistic? Ned? I'm uh, querulous. I, I, don't <laughs> I don't really know. The, uh, we, we're still going through the, the motions of Graham Rudman, and the administration is preparing now its, its budget. It's the, the numbers have been leaked in the papers already, and there's something like $50 billion short of meeting the Graham Rudman target. In, in the short run, my scenario is that, that if uh, the administration will cover some of that by tax increases, that the Congress would willingly go along with that. They, they don't want to uh, get, quote, out in front in the, in the newspaper jargon of the day on, on tax increases. But I think if the administration will, um, will accept some, that Congress will, will accept some. And, and if that happens, then I think we could get some reduction. And by the way, there are some possibilities for increasing taxes that, that don't necessarily worsen the tax distortions that, that Bill referred to. There are ways of, of adding to user fees or, or uh, well, in, in particular, the, the two large entitlements, both Social Security and Medicare, are financed out of a trust fund where the payroll tax is not really adequate to take care of the expenditures over a period of time. So that would be a logical candidate for some increases as well. Um, in the in the longer run, w would we uh, continue on the, or w would we continue the halting efforts in the form of deficit reduction that we have begun this year? That question is so in inextricably tied up in, in uh, political prognostication, what party is going to be in power, how strong is the president going to be versus the Congress, what are they going to want? What are the Democrats going to want when they figure out what their uh, what their goals are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That that I don't see how anybody can can really uh, say what's going to happen, and I'm not going to try to. Well, let's give Bill well, a try I to will, say. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. I'm on record in in predicting that the next administration that takes office in 1989 will face a uh, a deficit in fiscal in that year of 180 billion dollars. So I think the deficit will continue to be very large. It will not uh, be down to even manageable or tolerable sustainable levels uh, by that time. Uh, the budget that the President submits in January and the first congressional budget resolution of next year will not show deficits that high. But there is a fairly consistent record of actual outlays being about 4% or so higher than either the President's budget or the first budget resolution. And I think that we'll have significantly higher outlays than what either of them say uh, earlier in the year, and we'll have a substantially higher deficit, maybe $100 billion higher than the Graham-Rudman target for fiscal year 1989. 
And basically, I, I, the two of you then, I guess there's some disagreement there, perhaps at the, at the end, though not uh, much to, to, to be overstated. Perhaps what we could do now is, uh, is turn to our attentive audience and, and get them to ask some questions, which perhaps I haven't uh, asked of you thus, thus far. Uh, yes, we have one over here. Uh, we've passed the four-year mark since the last recession, and the, that's the average length of time uh, since World War II uh, for a recession to occur. Not many people are predicting one, but if one were to occur, what would be an appropriate fiscal policy given that we're running uh, 4 or 5% of GNP deficits and running monetary policy growth of 13%? No. Um, my preference is, is to do as little as possible in, in response to the recession. Most of the kinds of fiscal measures that are initiated during recessions are something that you live to regret very quickly uh, during the recovery. And I think that it, it takes considerable discipline to avoid turning, you know, opening the spending door or the spigot uh, at that time, but it's it discipline, I think, should be maintained. Ned? I, I agree with that. The, there are two other points, though, that I'd like to make. One is that we have what, uh, again, I'll, I will use a jargon term, we have what is known as automatic stabilizers, the fact that when there is a recession, tax revenues will decline automatically, unemployment benefits will go up automatically. These will happen. I would propose that we, we let them happen. And, and so there will be some stabilization of the recession from, from that. The second point, however, is that the fact that we are faced or, or could be faced with this awful choice in a recession is an indication of the problem that we have gotten ourselves into. Normally, we would say, if you have a recession, you could, you could use perhaps fiscal policy subject to some of Bill's caveats. You could use fiscal policy to fight the recession. But we have really uh, overused fiscal policy already. We're just not in a position to, to run another uh, large discretionary deficit on top of the automatic deficit. I, I think that we would, we would have even more trouble writing ourselves eventually. And so I think that uh, th that is certainly a, a, a definite cost of the, the deficits that we've had, that we, we just can't use this instrument in the way that it is uh, sometimes helpful to use it. Yes, Murray Foss. Uh, Milton Friedman has said that if you raise taxes, government spending will rise to equal the new higher level of taxes. I understand that uh, you have done a study uh, of this uh, bill. I wonder whether you could tell, tell us what your findings were. Well, I think the more important study uh, has been recently uh, completed by George von Furstenberg. He's looked very carefully at the relationship between changes in taxes and changes in spending in the United States in the post-war period using the most sophisticated techniques. And he finds no relationship between short-run changes in, in taxes and short-run changes in spending, none whatsoever. And that's contrary to the views of uh, Milton Friedman and President Reagan on one side, but also it's contrary to the views of, uh, of Jim Buchanan and Herb Stein on the other side. Buchanan has long suggested that deficits increase the level of spending because they reduce the perceived tax price of the services and, and transfers that are provided through the federal budget, and that an increase in taxes then would reduce spending, so it would have a double effect on reducing the deficit. Jim's conjecture also doesn't seem to be consistent with the evidence. Uh, the von Furstenberg study suggests that you have to address the issue of spending restraint head on. That by and large, you shouldn't expect much, of, much help from it, uh, from what's happening on the tax side of the budget. Ned, would you like to uh, add anything? No, I, I haven't seen the, uh, the von Furstenberg study, or, or for that matter, the Niskanen study, but I, I certainly agree with the conclusions. So, uh, Joe Cordes? To what extent do you think that the uh, Tax Reform Act of 1986 has really foreclosed the option of using income tax increases as a substantial means of narrowing the deficit? And, and if you think, indeed, that option has been severely limited, if not foreclosed, uh, what revenue sources do you think uh, might look attractive for that purpose? 
Well, I think there, there are uh, considerable additional revenues that can be raised that are consistent with the general objective of the Tax Reform Act of 1986, which was to lower rates. Uh, for example, uh, one of my favorites would be to substitute a $300 credit, tax credit, for the $2,000 personal exemption. Uh, that would raise a substantial amount of revenues from those people in the 28 and 33 percent brackets under the new code uh, without uh, increasing marginal tax rates. You can, there are many other features of, of, of that tax law that would also permit raising revenues without increasing rates. I think that the new law will have the beneficial effect of, of, making, uh, of making a rate change a politically dangerous thing to do. I regard that as a beneficial outcome of the Tax Reform Act. But there are still substantial revenues uh, increases that are consistent with, uh, without, uh, consistent with no increase in, uh, in marginal tax rates. Ned? I, I, would, I would go along with that. I, I think that uh, the, you, you could argue the issue another way, and that is that we have had significant base broadening, and, we, and, and this has enabled us to lower tax rates. On the one hand, those preferences that remain in the tax code look more unfair now to the people that gave up their tax preferences. On the other hand, the fact that the rates are lower means that there is less in it for the people who benefit so that the amount that they would be prepared to invest in lobbying and so forth should go down. And there are still a significant list of, of things that, that could go if we ever went at base broadening again. The homeowner preferences could go. We could begin to tax fringe benefits more than we do now. We could begin to, we, we have already made state sales taxes non-deductible and we could make the state and local income and property taxes non-deductible and there, there are many others. The second point there is that um, you, you could interpret the, the tax bill, I don't think anybody had this in mind, but one way of interpreting it is to, in, in making sales taxes non-deductible, there, there may be an encouragement of states to get out of that business, and it, it may be that at some future time we could have a national value-added tax or something like that. There are ways of, of removing the supposed regressivity of that through altering the credits on the income tax. I don't, I don't view that as a serious problem. And, and that may be a, a sensible complement now to the income tax that we have just um, left ourselves with. So I, I don't um, think that the Tax Reform Act has by any means precluded future revenue rises. And I think, uh, moreover, that there, there are many sensible ways that we could now uh, raise revenues with, given the, the Tax Reform Act. Frank, let, Russell, me, let me elaborate. Uh, I would oppose uh, a major new type of tax, like particularly like the value-added tax, unless we had uh, a constitutional restraint in place on the total taxing and borrowing authority of the United States. Uh, value-added taxes would be such a, a powerful revenue engine that I think it is likely to uh, fuel a, a rapid expansion of total spending in the United States. And that's, as I said, that's just contrary to what I reported as the results of the von Furstenberg study. <laughs> But I'm convinced that uh, over a longer period of time that the Social Security tax has been the major source of revenue growth in the United States and the value-added tax has been the major source of revenue growth uh, in Europe. Uh, and I would, I would be reluctant to see us put that kind of revenue engine in place until we had a, a stronger uh, set of restraints on the total taxing and borrowing authority of the government. Uh, Frank Russick. Yes. We've had large deficits now for several years, and you two have just discussed the uh, ill effects of these deficits on the economy. Yet some people, like Robert Eisner, have suggested that for various reasons, the deficit is not um, a very good uh, measure of the federal government's impact on the economy because of inflation, <laughs> changes in the government wealth position, and things like that. Um, do you have any views regarding? how one could better improve the measurement of the government's impact on the economy by just looking at the deficits or taxes or spending? Yeah. Well, there, there are any number of ways that we could 
compute the deficit either in a better way or in another way. We, we could uh, do as Eisner suggested and eliminate the inflation premium from interest rates. We could, you could uh, improve the treatment of the asset sales that we discussed previously. We could go all the way to a capital budget that uh, Donald Regan has, has said that he wants to do. We could adjust the budget for the cycle. You could, you could go on and on and on. The um, one, one can make a good case for a lot of these adjustments, but even if one makes a lot of the adjustments in the recent period, you find that deficits are much higher than they used to be. So a lot of what we're talking about is a problem that, that goes beyond the measurement issue. The measurement issue obviously changes the numbers and we get different numbers if you counted things differently, but you still get the same basic story and that is that we have a worse deficit problem by a lot than we used to have. The second point I would like to make about this is that if, if we want to look at something in particular about the economy and the impact of fiscal policy, I would look at the share of output that we devote to domestically originated capital formation, that is capital formation net of this foreign borrowing that, that we talked about earlier, and that too has plummeted in the recent period. And I think that, that uh, again, that, that convinces me that, that we have a serious problem with fiscal policy, however we measure it. The measurement issues are, are important and some and sometimes they can change your story dramatically, but this time I don't think they do. Bill, would you like to add anything? Uh, I don't believe there is any one right way or at least one uh, correct way for all purposes to represent the, uh, the, uh, the federal budget. Uh, the federal budget at the moment is basically a cash budget and the deficit is the net amount of borrowing that the Treasury is going to have to do. But for any number of other purposes, you want to have a different perspective on the budget in terms of uh, what are the implicit liabilities behind the rapid accumulation of loan guarantees? What are the implicit liabilities in the Social Security system or in pension insurance or on deposit insurance? You, but you don't need those kinds of estimates for management of Treasury cash flow, but you would like to have estimates of that nature, uh, of that nature to address whether those particular programs, whether it's deposit insurance or, or pension insurance or uh, or a social security system uh, themselves ought to be changed. I don't, I don't think that moving toward a capital budget or uh, making the government budget um, look more like a, an income statement, uh, a, business, uh, a, a business's income statement, I don't think that that's likely to enormously improve the uh, public decision making, but I think there is a case for looking at somewhat broader concepts or different concepts for particular purposes. Eisner's claim that somehow a different m measure of the deficit has uh, clear economic effects on the on uh, clear eff effects on the economy is a claim that I think is not supported. Yes, I suspect that by and large the intergenerational uh, inequities of income distribution are uh, worse in some sense than the intra-generational ones. Uh, all of this, coupled with the earlier discussion, suggests to me that there is lurking beneath the discussion an essentially non-economic judgment as to what the right rate of, trans of intergenerational transfers should be. Uh, what judgment underlies uh, your two views? Well, I have to be very brief. Time's just about <laughs> run out now. Perhaps, Ned, you could uh, respond to that uh, question. Well, the, uh, you are, of course, correct that, that uh, the whole question of how much of our output we devote to saving, building up the capital stock, providing for the future, is ultimately a question of income redistribution. Do we get it or do our kids get it? And in that sense, there is no objective argument that, that one can give. It could be that America has been saving too much all along. We have now cut our saving rate in about half, the way I compute it, and, and it could be that that's the right rate, and, and there is no logical reason for 
believing that, I mean, for, for uh, questioning that. There are, however, a lot of straws in the wind that point in the, in the other direction. There, one, one way you can uh, look at that question is uh, what, what is sometimes called a neutrality standard, that, that we ought to let the private sector determine saving rate and have the government not play a role. Well, the government is playing a big role now. It's withdrawing a lot of these saving to, uh, to, to provide for higher spending. There, there is a uh, fancy theoretical standard that, that is sometimes known as the golden rule of capital accumulation that, that tries to work this all out mathematically. And, and by that standard, we are way under saving. We are under saving compared with other countries in the world that we're competing with in international trade. And so you can look at this a lot of different ways. Nothing is absolutely conclusive, but they, a, a lot of them point in the direction that this consumption binge is the wrong thing to do at this particular time. Well, then on that less than optimistic note, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop. We'd certainly like to thank our, our two uh, distinguished uh, speakers for appearing here today, uh, Ned Gramlich and, and Bill Niskanen. You've done an excellent job, and we've had a very attentive audience, and, and that wraps up our program then on the federal budget and, and economic growth.